It's time for member statements. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to bring attention to the wind turbine project in the municipality of Dutton Dunwich, which is located in my riding. As this government is well aware, the municipality of Dutton Dunwich conducted a survey of residents before declaring themselves a non willing host, Shameful. with 84% of the community against the wind turbines. Strong message. This survey and report was shared with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Unfortunately, the government chose to ignore the people of Dutton Dunwich and move forward with the project. Later this afternoon, I'll be bringing forward a petition on behalf of the residents calling on the government to make it mandatory that all renewable energy developers use the new noise modeling guidelines. On January 23, 2018, the Dutton Dunwich opponents of wind turbines filed a notice of application for judicial review in the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. The application declares that the transition provisions should not be used in the large five renewable procurement wind turbine projects, which include projects like the Dutton Dunwich, the Strong Breeze, two in Chatham Kent, the Romney near Lakeshore and Otter Creek near Wallaceburg, and two in Eastern Ontario, Eastern Fields and Municipality of the Nation and Nation Rise in the Municipality of North Stormont. I'm calling this government to take the concerns of the Dutton Dun residents seriously, take the concerns of the communities and the provinces and the signatories in this petition and stop the project at Dutton Dunwich, or at least put it on hold until all the concerns are, are, are revised and addressed. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Member of statements, the member from London Fanshawe. Saturday, April 28th, I attended an event in London to recognize the day of mourning and injured workers. I was honored to attend the Step London Steps for Life, an organization walking for victims of workplace tragedy. Funds raised from this walk helps provide support services to families who have been affected by workplace tragedies and raise awareness about injury prevention. Threads of Life is a national not-for-profit charitable organization dedicated to supporting families along their journey of healing who have suffered from a workplace fatality, life-altering injury, or occupational disease. They bring awareness to the event every year and believe that injuries in the workplace are predictable and preventable. And through Steps for Life, they spread this important message. There were 40 events taking place across Canada, with more than 4,000 families, corporate teams, and partners participating. The community came together to mourn and honour all those who have been injured, afflicted with an occupational illness, and those who have lost their lives while working. This day of recognition provides each of us with the opportunity to stand side by side as workers across Ontario renew and inspire our commitment to improving the health and safety of every one in the workplace. In 2016, the greatest number of workplace deaths in the country was Ontario, and that is simply deplorable. We all have a part to play. Unions, management, employers, workers, and government all need to work together to reduce workplace injuries and better support injured workers. We cannot forget the work that still needs to be done, and the fight will only end when no worker has to risk his or her life on the job and can go home to their family. Thank you. Thank you. For the member, Davis, the member from St. Catharines. Saturday, May 26, we'll see thousands of people gather at Grantham Lions Park in North St. Catharines for the annual Rankin Cancer Run, an event that has raised $7,550,000 over the past 12 years and has attracted as many as 13,000 participants for a single day. Under the enthusiastic and capable leadership of RUN Director Marianne Edwards and the sponsorship of generous businessman Tom Rankin and the Rankin family, this outstanding fundraising endeavour, which dedicates all of its proceeds to local uh, health care facilities, has contributed $3.5 million to the St. Catharines General Hospital uh, Cancer Centre, $1.64 million to Wellspring Niagara, $380,000 for Hospice Niagara, $500,000 for West Lincoln Memorial Hospital, $450,000 for the Greater Niagara General Hospital, $349,000 for the Douglas Memorial Hospital, $315,000 for Welland County General Hospital, $240,000 for Port Colborne Hospital, $90,000 for the former Niagara and the Lake Hospital, and funding will go to Hotel Du Shaver this year. All of Niagara, all people in Niagara, are grateful to Marianne Edwards, Tom Rankin, and the fabulous uh, volunteer team for their tireless efforts and generosity, and to the walkers, runners, and sponsors for their energetic participation. Thank you. Further members, same as the member from Bruce Gray, Owen South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to bring to the attention of the Legislature the upcoming Vision Health Month, 
which is celebrated across Canada during the month of May. This is a time when we raise public awareness about the importance of protecting vision health and encourage interns to have a regular eye exams as they are the best form of early detection and prevention, improving the chances of detecting eye conditions early enough to help control and treat the disease. There are an estimated 5.5 million Canadians living with an eye condition that could lead to vision loss. Age-related macular edema is the leading cause of vision loss in this country, affecting 1.4 million Canadians, and diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of vision loss in working-age adults, affecting 500,000 Canadians. Many blinding eye diseases that affect children still have no treatments. That's why the Foundation Fighting Blindness funds sight-saving research, but there are effective sight-saving treatments for both age-related macular edema and diabetes-related vision. Unfortunately, many Canadians are losing their sight to preventable forms of blindness, including right here in Ontario. This is simply unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. We commend the work of the Foundation Fighting Blindness and hope to work collaboratively to build the tools and frameworks that will ensure that Canadians are not going blind when they don't have to. We also commend the work of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind (CNIB), the Canadian Council of the Blind (CCB), the Ontario Association of Optometrists, and all others who are raising awareness about eye health and help prevent avoidable sight loss across Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Great Lakes are an incredible gift of nature to this province, to the people who live in the Great Lakes Basin. Most of Ontario's population depends on those lakes. 40% of Ontario's, no, 40% of Canada's economy depends on the health of the Great Lakes. But there are incredible pressures to draw water out of the Great Lakes to areas that are not part of the basin. Recently, Racine, Wisconsin put forward a proposal to draw 7 million gallons a day for a new industrial project in one of their suburbs. 7 million a day, Speaker. Canadian Environmental Law Association and others are calling for a review of this proposal, given that it sets a dangerous precedent. We have the power and authority under the Great Lakes Agreement that Ontario is a signatory to. Ontario needs to protect our Great Lakes and use its power to call for a full review. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry is the person responsible for speaking out, and that in this statement, I ask her to, in fact, take hold of this file and move on it. The project is one of many that will come in the future if we don't stand up. It's time for Ontario to protect the Great Lakes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, last Friday I had the pleasure of attending the Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan annual fundraising gala in Kingston. CW4WA is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is for Canadians to take action in partnership with Afghan women towards improving the education and conditions of human rights, ending women's oppression, and providing opportunities for Afghan women to live their lives with dignity, certainty, and purpose. Since 1998, they have raised $8 million to support women and girls in Afghanistan. The theme for the gala this year is From Kandahar to Canada, Roya's Story, and featured guest speakers from Afghanistan, Roya Shams, as well as Michael Cook, an editor at the Toronto Star, who took a very active role in bringing Roya to Canada for her education. I want to thank Michael and Lisa Laflamme in particular for her fireside, fireside interview style with Roya. Her story was pin-dropping and so inspiring, but it, it also showed that the many barriers that girls face in Afghanistan. Her path demonstrates just how valuable organizations like the CW4WA are for women both at home and abroad. I want to give special thanks to the local chapter in Kingston, Madeline Tarasik, Margaret Stewart, and all of the Kingston chapter, including many of the retired teachers from the Retired Teachers Association, for all of their hard work in bringing a better life to women and girls in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Spring has at long last arrived. Lawns and trees are turning green, but unfortunately, the less than desirable species have also been revived. So I'd like to give the legislature an update on the invasive species Phragmites, or common reed. Since being given a tour of a frag-infested wetland in 2012 by the Lambton Shores Phragmites Community Group, I've been advocating for this government that action needs to be taken. Through statements, letters and questions, I've been telling the government about this very real threat to Ontario's wetlands. But despite increasing awareness, that threat is no less real today than it was six years ago. 
It is still spreading, and in every corner of southern Ontario, it has covered ditches and drains, rivers and streams. At this stage, manual cutting and burning is unrealistic and inadequate. Herbicides, which have been used against Phragmites for some time now across the United States and in several other Canadian pro provinces, um, but they're not allowed in Ontario. It took a long time, but the Ministry of Natural Resources is finally taking some small experimental steps toward using such herbicides to control the spread. Unfortunately, the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change has been blocking the approval of any of the safe glyphosate herb herbicides for use over water. I urge the ministers of this government to take this threat seriously and to work together to give speedy approval to the most efficient means of its control. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Davenport. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the 44th anniversary of Vincinque de Abril, the Carnation Revolution, which was a pivotal moment in the history of Portugal. On April 25th, the Portuguese community celebrates the peaceful disp uh, deposition of the authoritarian party Estado Novo, who had ruled Portugal from 1926 until its fall in 1974. April 25, 1974 is undoubtedly a pivotal moment in the history of Portugal. What started as a military coup organized by the Movimento das Forças soon became an unanticipated and unprecedented campaign of civil resistance. What came next was not only the fall of the Estado Novo, but also the withdrawal of Portugal from its African colonies in East Timor. The name Carnation Revolution comes from the fact that what was supposed to be an armed revolution transformed into a population that took to the streets to celebrate the end of a long and unforgiving dictatorship and war in the colonies by placing carnations into the muzzles of rifles and on the uniforms of the ar army. This past weekend, I attended a gala dinner hosted by the Cultural Association of April 25th, and present were also Capitães de Abril, Colonel Jorge Henrique Caetano and Colonel Antonio Marques Lopes, who came from Portugal to be present at this event. Mr. Speaker, as a Portuguese Canadian, I stand here today as a beneficiary of the courage and compassion of so many hundreds of thousands of Portuguese men and women that helped transform Portugal into the country that it is today. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge the exemplary job done in my riding to bring more accessible health care into rural communities. The nature of my riding makes access to care difficult for many. During my tenure as MPP for Prairie Sound Muskoka, I have witnessed tireless work on both sides of the riding to create sustainable and connected nursing stations and health hubs, which have proven to be a model for rural health care. With four health hubs, including a mobile unit in Muskoka and an impressive six nursing stations operating under the West Prairie Sound Health Centre, my riding has a very unique care model. This model has proven to be so successful that this year both sides of the riding are celebrating some milestones. As of April 1st of this year, it was announced that the Muskoka Community Health Hub Demonstration Project has been approved for permanent funding by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and I want to thank the Minister for that. Just this afternoon, the West Prairie Sound Health Centre is celebrating the, an expansion of care being offered at every one of its nursing stations, with the addition of more health care practitioners. The new on-site service Visits will now include mental health, social work, physiotherapy, nursing, and, a, and an additional nurse practitioner time. In representing both of these areas, I often hear from constituents about their difficulty accessing care, but I have also heard from many how these new and improved services are making their lives better. I particularly want to thank the nurse practitioners in the Perry Sound area for their exemplary services of late as the area struggles to deal with an ongoing doctor shortage. Their presence and care has been touted as a lifesaver in my offices many times over. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore time for reports by committees. The member from Scarborough.